Thank you very much. Hi everyone and thank you so much for having me today. It's great to see so many people here and thanks to uh, Creative Mornings and to Tractor and to Flynn for inviting me along. So um, I'm here to talk about empathy. So we all know what empathy is. Empathy is the ability to understand what's going on for other people, to take a walk in their shoes, to see the world that, as they see it and to perceive it and feel it as they, as they feel it. And the reason why I have been asked to come and talk on this topic is, um, is because I work at Fjord. So Fjord is a design and innovation company. Um, we were acquired by Accenture Interactive about two years ago. And what we do is put design at the heart of society, businesses and um, people. And what that really means is that we use empathy on a day-to-day -day basis as the primary tool for solving business problems. Um, for our clients. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction to what service design is and how we go about that and then I'm just going to talk to you about a few questions that you might want to consider asking yourself when you design products and services for, for people and then uh, finish off with just a thought on um, how we work with each other in the, in the corporate environment. So service design is a process um, where we use design thinking to have a really deep understanding of human beings and their behaviours, their needs, their motivations, their fears, both rational and irrational. Um, and we, we use that information to design products and services for people. So sometimes it's about designing new products and services for people, that's sometimes our clients ask to do that. And sometimes it's about improving existing products and services. Um, and sometimes it's about thinking about a sort of customer experience and the journey that people go through as they interact with the brand and all of those different touch points and thinking about how we can um, optimise that and take away all the friction and the forms and all the pain for people to make it a much more um, enjoyable experience. So we do that by really understanding the entire ecosystem. And so what we mean by that is that we think about all of the people within an ecosystem so that might be an end user, a customer. It might be an intermediary, someone who acts between the, the client and the end user. It might be a third party or a partner, and it might be a staff member. So it's everybody, all the human beings that co-produce a service are the people that we go out and we try to really understand. We also think about the products that everybody uses, digital products, physical products. We think about the place in which a service is experienced, and we think about the processes that um, help to deliver that service. And finally, we look at the performance of the whole ecosystem. So that might be the performance from the point of view of the human beings. Um, so things like the net promoter score, how well the, the, the service is being experienced by the customer. But it also might be the performance from a business point of view in terms of some of the metrics, you know, how efficient is it, how much growth is it, how much sales or revenue, those kind of metrics. So we really try to understand that as is state by doing deep research into the business and the people. And what we do is we take all of those insights to design a future state, a better state that's more efficient, that's more enjoyable to use, that is, um, that is more human at the end of the day. So how we do that is by getting to the real human truth. We go out into people's homes, we go out into the context in which they live. This is a, a, a real person that we went and spoke to. Um, we go into workplaces, we go into hospitals, we go into airports, we go into the places where services are delivered and we really um, seek to understand what's really going on. We take all of those insights into workshops and we bring everybody together to co-create a future. So we use the pain points that we've identified to think about ways to solve um, some of the problems. We do that in a very uh, collaborative way. We come up with hundreds of ideas and then we start to evaluate those ideas. We refine them, we choose uh, the best ideas that are gonna um, give us the best, sort of the biggest bang for our buck, which are gonna be the most effective in solving some of the problems that we've identified. And then of course, we test them. So we go out and we, um, we start small, we do pilots, we do prototypes, and once we know that it's robust, we scale it up. So that's basically service design in, in a nutshell. And what we find when we're working with clients on a day-to-day -day basis is that we um, are entering the era of living services. So it's no longer enough for a business to design a single service and mass produce it for everybody and deliver it in a single point of time. People, our clients need to create living services. So these are services that um, understand the human beings in a very deep level and 
flex and adapt and change and grow and learn about that human being as they go through life and as they change environments. So these are services that pick up a rich amount of information and data from all of the sensors in the environment around us, from the smartphones in our pockets, from the you know, desktops that, that we use that track all of our behavior and slowly learn and build up this really rich picture. And we use the um, data to drive real insights to help deliver services that are hyper contextualized and hyper relevant to people. Um, living services are coming about as a result of two, two forces. The digitization of everything, which I'm sure you've all experienced yourself. Um, there's a, one of, uh, a company called Starwoods Hotels and Restaurants, and they have now digitized doors. So what is probably the most unintelligent thing you can imagine, a plank of wood, has now been digitized because um, Starwoods Hotels uh, can, can now, their, their guests can now use their smartphone to unlock the door. So that means that these doors become intelligent. They can start to tell the flow of people in and out. They can start to know that when you come to set the room to certain preferences, to turn the telly onto the channel you like, to set the temperature, to open the blinds, those kind of things. So it's starting to create this whole set of um, new customer experiences. But what's interesting about it as well is for those hundreds of thousands of guests who go to these Star Wars hotels, it's starting to set an expectation. Well, if a door can be digitized and can be intelligent, what else in the environment can be? And so what we're seeing is this, um, what we're seeing is uh, what we're calling the rise of liquid customer expectations. And what it, that is, is that um, we are seeing that it's no longer enough for a business to look at what competitors are doing in their own industry and think about, wow, we better, you know, jump in the coattails of that and design that into our service. Because customers are now taking their expectations from the best service experiences that they have across multiple industries. So for example, if that's um, hailing a cab and watching it as it comes to you, jumping in the cab and stepping out and making a payment in the cloud, that sets a, a, a new set of customer um, experience expectations with the, um, human beings. And they bring those best of breed experiences from travel, from their bank, from their utility, and they expect every service to deliver that. So it's this rising tide of customer expectations. So these living services are gonna be designed around individuals. And that's, what, um, uh, and that's where the empathy comes in, because in order to design a living service, you really have to know your, your user very, very, uh, very well. So there's four questions that you might want to ask when you set about trying to understand what's going on in the service environment. Firstly, how well do we know our customer? How well do we know our stakeholders that we're working with? What did we make together today? And what did we break together today? So, starting with how well do we know our customers? So, it began, begins with a really deep understanding of people. And it means putting people back into the center of an experience. So we work with companies all the time who design um, products and services around their own internal departments or around their own internal product lines. And there's no sense of the human being being at the center of all of this and designing products and services that flex around that, that person. It's also about understanding people as they move through different life stages. So people's needs change over time and things that are important to them change over time. And understanding what's important to a student compared to someone who's just about to get married, compared to someone who's going through a divorce, is very different. So thinking about life stages as a way to design services, as well as putting the customer at the center, is, is a really critical part of what we do. And the way that we do that is through ethnography. So that is about going out and talking to people in the field, shadowing them, talking to them, walking through a service experience with them, all sorts of techniques to really um, get an understanding of what's going on that you would just never get by sitting in a glass tower in the city and trying to design services for these people. So for example, we went and um, we're working with um, a few government agencies at the moment to, re to redesign some of the services to be more digital and to be more customer centric. And um, w as a part of that, we've done research in sort of all the different states of, of Australia. And we went up to Darwin as part of um, one of our ethnography field trips. And um, 
you know, when you think about designing services, there's a few things that you might take for granted if you are designing it from a very urban environment, you know, given our context of our life. And you might think that we all speak English, that we all have a, a tax file number and a photo ID of some, some point, and that although it might be painful, we've all got access to either digital services or we can pick up a telephone or we can walk into a, um, a retail environment to, to get advice or get services from the government. But we spoke to these people um, and we discovered a completely different set of realities. So uh, this is um, NAJA, N-A-A-J-A, and they are a government agency that provides um, services to people, um, Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory. And through spending time with them, we learned that um, English isn't always English. So although um, in some of these rural communities, English is spoken, sometimes English is actually used in a very different way. For example, the verb to kill actually means, um, for, in some Aboriginal communities, the same thing as to, to hit or to injure. So you can imagine that that might be quite a, um, an interesting miscommunication in certain circumstances if someone is reporting something um, when they're using English in a slightly different way. We also um, found that there's, there's no telephone lines and there's no uh, mobile towers whatsoever. It's for thousands of kilometres. These people at Naja have to fly in to service these, um, these remote communities. And we also found out that quite often they don't have any official um, record with the government. And so one of the most common things that we discovered was that when um, they, when someone has been um, recently bereaved, it's very difficult to get hold of a deceased relative's estate because they have no tax file number and they've got no photo ID or no driving license. And therefore the Data Protection, Data Protection Act kicks in and these people are effectively kicked out because they can't prove who they are to access these services. So when we go out and we talk to people in these environments, you, you start to see um, a very different perspective and think about how you solve people's um, problems in a very different way. So we also need to ask how well do we know our stakeholders. So when we're working with our clients, it's really important to understand the business context in which they operate. So thinking about their political um, environment, thinking about how they're measured, thinking about what really matters to them, um, thinking about how they're going to tell the story that you're providing information about. Because you know, one of the greatest ways that we think that we've achieved success if it's someone that, that we're working with, the client sponsor actually gets promoted. And we've seen that happen a number of times. And that's by being empathetic to them and um, giving them the tools to be really successful and about really understanding their context and their business context to be able to do that. But it's also about thinking about the staff. So in a service, the service is co-produced by lots of different people. So you can't really design a service. You only design for a service. You kind of can provide lots of different um, systems and processes, but it happens in real time with human beings on the spot. Um, and so you can't really design it exactly. But we've been working um, with a company to uh, look at um, field technicians. So when you think about a, a, a service, there's two sides of it. There's the customer experience, but there's also the staff experience. So it's the staff who deliver a service to, to, to end users. It's really two sides of the same coin. And so we quite often are working with the staff who deliver these services to really understand, again, from a very human point, a human point of view, what is going on for them. How are they um, experiencing a day in the life? Um, what are their impediments? What are the tools that they use? What are the processes? What are the things that either hinder or help them? So we worked with these field technicians um, and it's a very physical, dirty, job. We went um, in their vans with them as they drove around and, and did home visits to people's house to, to fix the things that, they, you know, that, that, um, that they were being called to fix. And what we discovered by being empathetic and really watching and observing is that the technicians, for example, they have a big um, laptop called a, um, a tough book. And it's this enormous, fat, heavy thing that they, um, it's like a, a PC, but a really rugged thing. And it's heavy. And it's, you know, they've been given that so that they can, um, you know, so it won't get broken, so their dirty, grubby fingers won't make, you know, marks, etc. 
But what that means is that it's too heavy to lug around on, on their jobs. So instead of um, using the, those, uh, all the functionality on that, they actually take a paper and pen into people's homes and they have to go and write what's happening. And at the end of the day, they then have to go back at the, at the end of their shift and digitize all of that um, content. The other thing we found is that when these guys turn up at somebody's house, they are the sort of the front face of this particular company. And any problems that a customer has with that company, whether it's related to the call out issue or not, they tend to bear the brunt of it. So people just lambast them. And sometimes they turn up at someone's house and it might actually be the fourth or the fifth technicians that, that's been out to solve this problem. But this technician doesn't know that. So they turn up ready to help, to provide a great customer experience. And they get a really irate, angry customer opening the door and shouting at them. So it's a really tough environment. And then they go into somebody's home and that's a very intimate space. They see all sorts of different types of homes. Sometimes, um, you know, it's a really filthy home with, you know, hoarders and like, you know, they can't get to what they need to get to. Sometimes there's a pit bull. Sometimes, you know, it's a really pristine home where, you know, the p person doesn't want them to touch anything. You know, so they have to go into these people's houses and, and um, it's, a, it's a really kind of confronting thing that they have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So we went in their vans and we traveled around with them. We got to understand their toolkits. We got to understand their digital products that they use. And we sat in people's homes and waited for the technician to arrive and observe what happened through the whole um, thing. The other thing that we observed was that um, quite often the technician has to do a physical um, fix, for, you know, putting two wires together. But in order to complete the job, they actually have to call a call center um, to get someone in the back of house team to do the, the sort of the deep, enterprise architecture connection. But when they did that, they had to actually wait on hold, sometimes for 20, 30, 40 minutes to the call center before they could actually speak to someone and then wait for another 10 or 15 minutes for someone to complete that job. So the whole time they're sitting in somebody's house on their sofa, waiting on the phone to have this, um, this part of the job completed for them. So all of these are the kind of pain points that you just wouldn't see or know if you didn't go out and really um, understand what's going on for them. So for these particular guys, some of the things that we came up with was firstly, we've given them all of the, um, the, the, the tools that are on their tough book on their mobile phone. So now they've got it in their pocket and they can take it up the poles and down the poles and into the exchanges and into the pits and pillars and all the dirty places that they go. We've also given them a customer dashboard on their phone so that they can see on their phone um, everything they need to know about the customer, how many previous visits there's been, is that customer a happy customer or an unhappy customer? What other products and services do they use? Giving them context about the house. Is there a dog that you, know, you need to be careful of? Just some of these you know, just basic things. So they've got that. And then we've also given them the ability to connect that line, the thing that that back of house team used to do on their mobile phone. So something that used to take them two hours a day is now taking them you know, a minute. And they're empowered, they're more efficient, and they don't have that awkward experience of sitting on someone's sofa and, and having to wait on a, on a line. So these are the kind of things that you can find by really understanding your customers and your stakeholders and your staff that you're working with. And then it's important to, to think about what do we make together today? So when, um, when we're working with our clients, we're quite often working with wicked challenges. So these are challenges that are not simple. There's not a technical answer that's been done before where you know, it might be complex, but like building a bridge or open heart surgery or creating a website, there's kind of a really clear and understood way of delivering um, or, or you know, fixing that problem. With wicked challenges, they're much more complex. They're boundaryless, they're non-linear, they require lots of different people. And so with these challenges, we find that um, we always use this adage, which is nobody is as smart as all of us. So we get lots of different people in to collectively solve the problems. And it's lots of different people from across that ecosystem, the end users, the, 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 um, the staff members, internal um, executives, all the third parties. We get everybody in together and we workshop it. So we take all of those insights from the research to build empathy with all the people in the room so that they all understand what it's like to be one of those people. And then we use that as a way to ideate. So I'm gonna show you a little video now. Um, we worked with a, a team at the Bright Alliance to redesign um, how cancer treatment services are delivered to patients. Imagine a world that doesn't look anything like the world you work in today. We don't have a world full of paper. We don't have a world where the controls of the way we do our business are necessarily the same as they are today. And start to think about a world that looks 
quite different from the world that you know today. The two really big things for me is the collaboration and getting people all around the table working together from different areas of the, the Bride Alliance organisations and the fact we've got lots of really great innovative people who are going to take this forward. They just need someone to help them move it forward. I think it's important from both um, Accenture's point of view as well as our point of view because we're, we were struggling to understand what the Bright Alliance was and now I personally have a much clearer idea of what the Bright Alliance is. Coming today, I guess my expectations were that it would be a much smaller group, probably a little bit more didactic, so I was really surprised at how much I enjoyed and how much I got out of the day in that we were put into small groups and really given creative ways to bring out different ideas and interests and areas where people had a different agenda. Uh, so it was really good to work with everybody to try and work out how we can actually improve the patient experience and also the staff experience for the new Bright Alliance Centre. It's starting to make, um, I think, what we feel is important come uh, rise up above the slogans about what the Bright Alliance is, is always trying to achieve. I think working in public health often we don't have the opportunity to engage in processes like this at this level so it was just exciting to actually be involved in something that will have true meaning and true goals and will actually have an outcome to it. I think that's really important. It's about how we're actually going to be the Bright Alliance, how we're going to work together, how you actually cross the boundaries between the research and the clinical area. How do we make sure it's all about the patient at the end of the day? Because that's what we're all there for, is to make an improvement on someone's life. I think today was really useful in moving forward. I also feel really excited about what the staff will have access to in terms of streamlined infrastructure and the ability to concentrate on delivering our best patient care in a world's best practice. So the ideas of trying to see how we can merge together from a, I guess today's uh, emphasis was on a technological perspective is, um, is really seeing the practical sort of like side of how this could become possible. So what we find when we bring lots of different people into these workshops is that people love being given the opportunity to have a voice in creating the change that they're going to have to implement. So um, they, they really uh, feel valued. They feel um, that they've got a say in, in designing the new services that they're going to deliver. And, um, and it's, you know, it's just so much easier to implement change with the people if the people have been there on the whole journey. So you get that buy-in, you get the excitement, you get the, the buzz, you get them going out and talking to other people in their organisations. And the sort of change management of how you move from the current state to a future state becomes much easier. So um, we also do a lot of co-design. So the technicians that we were talking about um, the, and those tools that we created on the mobile phone, they, we actually got sort of seven of them from across Australia to come together to basically design their own tools. So again, really bringing all the human beings in to, to co-design um, the, both the services but also the products that they might use is a really important part of what we do. And then finally, um, what did we break today? So uh, it's really important to embrace failure. So that means getting your new products and services out to people as quickly as possible testing it with them, getting their feedback, watching, again, using your empathetic skills to, to look for things such as anxiety or stress when they're trying to complete a task or, or engage with a new service. So really using um, those same skills of empathy, curiosity, listening, patience, all of those things that we as designers use to help to um, make, test, learn and repeat. So really iterating very quickly. So I have one last thought, which is to think about how empathy plays out in your work environment um, and with your, your teammates. So I think it's really important to, um, to be very socially connected with your teammates. And the reason for this is that there's a, a great um, experiment done by MIT where they, um, they brought in hundreds of people and they put them into groups and they got them to solve, they asked them to solve some really challenging problems. 
And what they found was the groups that were most successful were not the groups that had the highest individual person who had, you know, who was super intelligent and high IQ, nor was it the teams that had the, mo the, the highest collective IQ. It was actually the teams that showed the highest degree of social sensitivity to each other, which is empathy. So they did an empathy test, and the, the, it's, there's a, basically a test where they, um, they do uh, the reading the, the mind and, and an eye, the, reading the mind and reading the eye test. And the teams that scored the highest on that were the ones that were most successful. The teams that were also the most successful were the ones that gave um, roughly equal, t equal time to each other. So there was no one dominant voice and people were really um, empathetic about giving everybody voice. Neither were there any passengers, but um, that was a really important point of, of what was also very um, prevalent in these successful groups. And then the final thing was that these groups also had more women in them. Which is interesting, but, and, and I think they don't really know the reason why, but they, they think that it might be that um, women tend to score a little bit higher in the empathy test. And so you sort of have a doubling down on the empathy quotient. So, um, you know, in terms of how to create a really fantastic work environment and really high performing teams who can solve some of these complex challenges that we're working with our clients to solve, social connectedness is really key. Um, helpfulness outperforms individual intelligence, as this test showed. And, um, and what's really important about um, creating this culture of helpfulness and, and empathy is actually um, spending time with each other. Social bonds, um, going to the pub, having coffees together, water cooler moments, it's those kind of things. And time in the job together. The longer you spend with people, the more you get to know each other, the more you build trust, and the more you build loyalty and a deep understanding of each other. So that empathy, again, really helps you in a team environment to deliver um, fantastic outcomes. So that is all I have to talk to you today about. Thank you very much for, for listening to me. <laughs>